so let's talk about design a little bit because mm -hmm. when you design a car, you're designing it from from the top down, and you're you're talking to an audience here that um, struggles every day with managing complexity yes. in in design. So, exactly right. so so what's your your message there? How how do General Motors engineers manage that kind of complexity today? Well, we think uh, math-based tools are very much at the heart of it. Virtual engineering and virtual vehicle development is, is key. SQL, we only built two of them. And so we did everything in math uh, right up front. And just two weeks ago, we drove SQL from Rochester, New York to New York City, over 300 miles on public roads in real traffic conditions, with four adults in the car running the air conditioner. And it, it completed that trip. Both of them actually completed the trip safely with great enjoyment of the driving on one tank of hydrogen. We emitted just water on that entire trip mm -hmm. and we created the hydrogen from electricity generated at Niagara Falls, so it was clean, renewable electricity. And all of that was modeled in math ahead of time. And then we were able to actually design this surface that you see here and all of the, the dimensions in math and hand it off to the people who work directly from that math. And we're talking about a highly interdependent control strategy where you have uh, hydrogen going into a fuel cell, creating electricity. You've got lithium ion batteries storing electricity from regenerative braking. You're blending mm -hmm. the electricity from the stack and for the batteries, and then you're controlling the steering and braking by wire. So all of the controls and code had to be developed as well. We couldn't do any of that without these math tools. The reason I'm here at this design automation conference is to leave a message for the audience that we really need their capabilities focused on electrically driven vehicles and the future DNA of the automobile to get us to that next plateau because of the complexity. Everything is now dependent on everything in a car. In the past, maybe you could convince yourself the brakes were independent of the engine. That's no longer the case when you have regenerative braking. And so th these people are right on the critical path of the future of our industry. What was the turnaround time on this, on this design? Well, we um, envisioned doing it, um, I'd say we were about 18 months in total. Wow. And I'm going to show some footage of the uh, Corvette uh, design today um, in my presentation, which is pretty neat. We have a technology we call Visualize, which helps us uh, take sketches from uh, designers and then turn them into surfaces and then get the, uh, the grid, the math grid behind that. And um, we went all in math with that, all the way up to being able to see virtually a three-dimensional full-size Camaro concept car sitting in a setting like out on our design patio, all with uh, 3D goggles and stuff like that. And then we took that exact uh, data and gave it to the supplier, and they, they can turn those things around in, in you know, three, four months. So it's really moving fast. I, so presumably you were involved in the EV1 design? Well, actually, no, I, I wasn't. I, I, um, Early on in my research career, I did some work on studying whether electric vehicles made sense, but then I went into the operating side of the business at GM from 1988 to 1998. Okay. So I was off working in plants and quality and all of those things when EV1 played out, but I've been very close to it since 1998 when I came into my current job. I'm quite familiar with, with everything we've done there. Can you speak to how the design paradigm for this vehicle differed from the EV1, EV2? Yeah, yeah. In fact, first I want to start with the similarities. You know, some people have watched a movie called Who Killed the EV1? No one has. The people who developed the power electronics, the electric motors, and the controls for EV1 are based in Torrance, California. They are the same people who've developed those same requirements for our hybrid vehicles. They're the same people who developed the electric traction system, power electronics, and controls for this vehicle sequel as well as the Chevrolet Volt. They're extraordinary uh, systems engineers and electronics engineers. And the key is the learning that we've had from generation one to generation two to generation three on power electronics and controls. And that learning, yeah, you can write about it and you can talk about it, but it's in people. And yeah. Those people are alive and well, and they're doing some extraordinary work to enable the future of electrically driven vehicles. Now, interestingly, EV1 was a pure battery electric vehicle that had lead acid batteries and then went to nickel metal hydride batteries and the battery clearly was the uh, rate limiting uh, uh, technology and we saw lithium ion on the horizon and we actually even had an EV1 where we extended it, put a back seat in it and put an engine generator on the car 
So you had a range extension because the issue with the customers was, geez, after I've gone 80 miles, where am I going to plug in and can I wait five or six hours for a recharge? Yeah, right. And the answer was no, and that's why we only had about 800 to 1,000 customers. So the idea of range extension existed in that EV1 time frame, um, but the goal was zero emission vehicle. Right. So range extended electric vehicle is not a zero emission vehicle. It is when you're driving it on the battery, but whenever you've exceeded the battery's storage capability, you've got to kick it on and you have some emissions. So that kind of dynamic made us gun shy. What if we would have moved then rather than moving now with the Chevrolet Volt? Now, with this particular vehicle, it's an electrically driven vehicle, the sequel. It has a lithium ion battery to use the electricity from regenerative braking marries that up with the electricity from the fuel cell, but the electric drive and the power electronics and all those controls all have their same um, roots in what we did with EV1. I came down to, to Torrance because there was, there was this uh, engineering sort of cult, if you will, among some of our readers who had mm -hmm. EV1s. And they were, um, they were doing some sort of crude uh, hacking using their, you know, the early Palm Pilot yeah. into the uh, electrical system. So I came down and did a story on these guys, and they were just so passionate about that vehicle, and then so bummed out when that. It was a phenomenal vehicle. Ended. It's still the most efficient production vehicle ever built. And hey, would we like to plate our hand over from when we launched the vehicle until we took it out of production? Absolutely. I think we, we really didn't play it well on the PR side. But I can assure everybody that the technology is alive and well. The people who have been behind that technology are alive and well. They continue to do great things for General Motors and the auto industry and the world. And they really are enabling what we think is the future DNA of the automobile, which will be electrically driven cars and trucks. Well, Larry Burns from General Motors, you are uh, in the crucible of, of design <laughs> in the future. We look forward to uh, listening to your speech. Thanks for chatting with us. Thank you very us. much. It's my pleasure. Nice to meet you.